we gather this morning to find and comfort, to find joy and comfort in one another. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, BUC. I wanted to say a quick word about the music that you will hear today. Traditional Diné Navajo chants were used as sources of inspiration for the piano music that you will hear this morning, which were originally released on composer Connor Chi's album titled The Navajo Piano in 2014. These pieces draw from the rhythms, forms, melodies, and methods of development used in traditional Navajo music. Some of the pieces are close transcriptions of the songs, while other pieces focus only on elements such as rhythm and recurring melodic patterns. You will hear two Navajo preludes for the piano, which are based on the melodies of three songs from the Navajo Enemy Way ceremony, which is a ceremony designed to dispel violence and evil. You will also hear one Navajo vocable for piano. Um, and this vocable is based on a Navajo corn grinding song. Um, and so in the, the vocables are based on chants rather than ceremonial practices. So I hope you enjoy this prelude for piano. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. <laughs> Sounds like you've been expecting that. It's good to hear. It really is good to be together, especially on mornings like this, where everything just, for me at least, hit just the wrong beat. But we bring it together, and we're here. Whether you're joining us in the sanctuary or remotely via Zoom, or watching this recording later, it's good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We call this connection our opportunity to greet our virtual neighbors. So first, We'll be bringing everybody up on Zoom. We ask for, if you're attending, turn it up on the, turn on the camera. Give us a wave. 
And then we're going to turn right back to that camera over there. And we're going to return the favor. Hello, everyone. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC. At home, on campus, in the world, every day, we are Birmingham Unitarian Church. And we are building the beloved community. This morning, we join with other Unitarian Universalists around the world as we light our chalice. We gather, we bring our sorrows, our disappointments, our failures. We gather for healing, for laughter, and to rejoice. We gather to find new ways of loving, thinking, being. We gather. Yes, always we gather, for it is in gathering that we find our hope. Introducing the first theme, uh, the first hymn for today, number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth. Please rise in body and spirit and sing together four verses of For the Beauty of the Earth. Thank you. You know, using this was so much easier when I didn't have to wear a mask. This month's theme has been generosity. This week, we are focusing on the generosity of thanks, the 
giving. This week, we are focusing on the generosity of thanks and of giving. Seems kind of redundant, but it's there. First, however, we would like to read a land acknowledgement. The campus of our church, Birmingham Unitarian Church, occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Ashinabi, which is three which is the Three Fires Confederacy of the Jibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. Bloomfield Hills is situated on land ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit. We, recognize, or we acknowledge Michigan's 12 federally recognized Native nations, as well as the historic indigenous communities in Michigan. We also acknowledge indigenous individuals <laughs> and communities. <laughs> we also acknowledge indigenous individuals and communities who live here now and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. Also to note this week, this Monday is Trans Day of Remembrance. In November 1998, Rita Hester was murdered for being transgender. Her murder is yet to be solved. A year, le a year later in the city of San Francisco, a candlelight vigil marked Rita's death and others who had died for simply being or being seen as transgendered. As Forbes tracked in an article this week, 320 lives, 320 members of humanity were murdered for just being themselves in 2023. This Monday, we remember to stand proud with our trans friends and families. For today's Time for All Ages, I'm going to be reading this wonderful book that was donated by Betty Moan, and it's adapted from a U.S. Poet Laureate Joy Harjo's poem, Remember. It was originally published in 1983, but this book is accompanied by some beautiful, beautiful illustrations from Caldecott medalist Michaela Goda. Joy and Michaela are indigenous creators of the Muscogee and Tlingit nations, respectively. As you listen to the words or follow along with the text, I invite you to pause and reflect on the wonder of the world around you and the importance of your place in it. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she was or is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that it is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away to night. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You were evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. 
They are alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember, you are all people, and all people are you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember. At this time, all of our children and youth are invited to join us in Hodas Hall for Ari's Baker Space. We'll see you all again after the service and enjoy their confectionery delights all together as we celebrate our November birthdays in this beloved community. It is that time in our service where we ask for you to share. The mission, our mission at Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we like to leave out this mission, live out this mission, is by giving half of our plate collection to a worthy cause, a nonprofit organization that shares our organization and addresses needs in one of the areas we care about, environmental action and economic justice, civic engagement and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. Our, no, our, our recipient for November is none other than our own Emerging Needs Fund, which is used to provide direct support to people experiencing financial difficulty. This includes both people from our congregation and people of the community who contact the church, who have experienced a loss or hardship. We find that uh, these needs often increase during the winter months. Please be generous.
but this being an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we accept your gratitude to the good works of our congregation and dedicating ourselves to its service. We come to the time in our service for the sharing of joys and sorrows. Uh, Jess Newman and Kevin Kozlowski are expecting their second child uh, in May. And also, <laughs> they're celebrating Blaze's second birthday today. It's always best when you start out with the joys. <laughs> Um, on a more somber note, uh, Judy Amir fell last Saturday, and our Saturday evening and broke her hip. She has been admitted to Beaumont Hospital and will have a hip replacement in the next day or two. The post-op plan is not yet known. Judy is guessing rehab sent her before home. Uh, she should be up and walking the day after the surgery. Um, perhaps not surprising, those, uh, those of us who have had the pleasure of knowing Judy uh, she is in good spirits. It seems pretty uh, impossible for her not to be, I would say. <laughs> so, um, and just by way of an announcement, um, it would be a joy to see many of you at the annual, uh, annual Alliance Holiday Luncheon on Tuesday, December 5th at 12 noon at the Iroquois Club. Uh, reservations are $35 and are due by Monday, November 27th. Uh, please, please see Polis, Pro, Priscilla Hildum, uh, Ann Calamini or Carol Wiseman after service for details. As we move deeper, into our service, we'd like to take a moment to move deeper into ourselves with each other. As a way of voicing our pact with one another as a covenantal faith, I'd like to take a moment to recite our covenant. As a covenantal faith tradition, this is everyone. Oh, it's not up there. I would. Well, in all our actions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions and be mindful of our shared humanity in my communications. Pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus we do covenant with one another. And now, let's move into something a little more personal, our embodied practice. When's the last time you hugged yourself? Physical touch has a very positive effect on our bodies even if it comes just from us. Let's all take a few seconds to give ourselves a big hug. You could also massage your face, rub your arms or legs. Close your eyes, soften your gaze as you feel comfortable. If we did that right, we should all feel better together just a little bit. Now we would like to move into a moment of silence to honor those joys, those sorrows who may not have been spoken. 
for the burdens we carry that we are not yet ready to share, for the lives we touch and the lives that touch us. Our first reading is from Thanksgiving as a Day of Mourning by Mika Johnson. In 1617, a few years before English settlers landed, an epidemic began to spread through the area that became southern New England. It likely came from British fishermen who had been fishing off the coast, of, uh, off the coast for decades. By 1620, 90 to 96% of the population had died. It decimated the tribes and left many other villages empty. One of those villages was Poxtut. When the English villagers arrived at Plymouth Harbor, they found a cleared village and with, with fields recently planted in corn. This was a big part of the reason they chose it for their settlement. All of the village's people had died and the epidemic, uh, for, from the epidemic, except for one, whom we know today as Squanto. We never really hear the whole story about Squanto. We hear he taught the settlers how to plant corn and fish and hunt the local area. But how did he, was it that he learned how to speak English? Here is the story as told by James Lowen. As a boy, along with four Penobscots, he was probably stolen by a British captain around 1605 and taken to England. There he probably spent nine years, two in the employ of a Plymouth merchant who later helped him arrange passage back to New England. He was uh, to enjoy home life for less than a year. In 1614, a British slave trader seized him and two dozen fellow Indians and sold them to slavery in Spain. Squanto escaped from slavery, made his way back to England, and in 1619, uh, talked the ship captain into taking him and a guide on his next trip to Cape Cod. Squanto walked to his home village only to make the horrifying discovery that he was the sole member of his village still alive. All the others had perished in the epidemic two years earlier. Perhaps this is why Squanto was willing to help the Plymouth colony who had settled, his, who had settled in his people's village, or perhaps he was there to keep an eye on them. The settlers, too, lost half their people during the first hard winter. 
There were only 53 settlers who survived until the Harvest Festival that was declared later, uh, later declared to be the first Thanksgiving. It was a brief moment of tentative peace. One generation later, the English settlers and the Wampanoag were at war. For many Native people uh, in our time, a day called Thanksgiving has been a day of mourning for the hundreds of years of losses suffered by their people. Our second reading today is from David Schwartz. Who was freedom for? We gather at Thanksgiving in some sense to retell the creation myth of our country. In this myth, it is our very best and our very worst, a boldness, a care for the common good, a wish to say we before I. Yet from even before the first Thanksgiving feast, it's a story of theft and violence, and a ruthlessly narrow of who we means. The colonists had come seeking freedom, and in that we identify with them. But it was freedom only for themselves. In every generation forward, from this day and from that day and to this, the people living in the land that became America struggled always with the question, who is freedom for? Black persons were taken from their native Af Africa to become slaves. Immigration laws were written explicitly to prohibit non-Western Europeans. Women could not vote even a century ago. In many states right now, Gays and lesbians can be legally fired or evicted merely for not being straight. This was written in 2018, still holds true. Refugees knock and in response, voices call to bar the door. The Universalist minister, Clarence Skinner, wrote a century ago, the fight for freedom is never won each generation must win for itself the right to emancipate itself, emancipate itself from its own tyrannies, which are never or which are ever unprecedented. Therefore, those who have been reared in freedom bear a tremendous responsibility to the world to win an even larger and more important liberty. So may it be for us. We are, in the we are the inheritors of our liberty, one with sweat and labor and blood of generations before us. May we be a people committed to winning an ever larger liberty for the generations that follow. Who is freedom for? May the answer today and always, every one, of us.
In just a few days, we'll take part in our annual celebration of Thanksgiving. While we may perceive Thanksgiving as a uniquely American holiday, several other nations devote a date on their calendars to express their collective gratitude. These include Brazil, Canada, Grenada, Liberia, the Netherlands, and the Philippines. In addition, Germany, Japan, and the United Kingdom each celebrate similar holidays under different names. The early history of Thanksgiving in the United States occurred shortly after the arrival of Europeans in New England. The ever-changing relationship between the Pilgrims and the Native Americans is reflected in the historical record, which yields some stories of both harmony and of bloody conflict. We're all familiar with the, the traditional story behind Thanksgiving. In National Native Perspectives on Thanksgiving, curators at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian write, that first Thanksgiving is often portrayed as a friendly harvest fest celebration where pilgrims and ge generic nameless Indians came together to eat and give thanks. The story is a myth that was sparked in the mid uh, 19th century when English accounts of the 1621 harvest event resurfaced and fueled the American imagination. Romanticized paintings and stereotypical images of pilgrims and Indians celebrating the first Thanksgiving became part of national nostalgia and manifest destiny sentiment as the United States pushed west. Well, while there is some truth in the traditional narrative, it remains largely incomplete, while its popularity obscures the most tragic episodes of colonial treatment of Native Americans. In what is often regarded as the first Thanksgiving of 1621 in Plymouth, Massachusetts, although there, were other, there are other stories of earlier commemorations, the 50 pilgrims who survived the first year of in North America were deeply grateful for several reasons. Among them was an abundant harvest and the welcome benevolence of the Wampanoags, a Native American tribe that had partially survived a pandemic brought by other Europeans in 1617. Over the previous winter, the Wampanoags provided the newcomers with food during their time of scarcity in exchange for protections from the uh, Narragansett, a hostile neighboring tribe. The pilgrims, not to be confused with the Puritans, held a three-day festival of gratitude, probably in September of 1621. When members of the Wampanoag arrived, they brought food to add to the celebration, and they were warmly welcomed by the Europeans. The event including features unlike Thanksgivings of the modern era. Um, in fact, um, the word Thanksgiving wasn't even used. Food served may have included wild turkey in addition to duck, um, deer, swan, and even lobster. There was no pumpkin pie. The pilgrims had no access to flour or sugar. A mere 16 years later, in the nearby Connecticut colony, a group of English Puritans led by John Mason participated in the, in the Pequot Massacre, also known as the Battle of Mystic Fort. On May 23, 1637, in retaliation for the murder of, col of col colonist John Oldham, Mason directed his forces to set fire to the fortified Pequot village. Villagers who attempted to escape the blaze were shot. Estimates of the number dead range from 400 to 700. The incident touched off the Pequot War, which lasted until 1638. In the Plymouth Colony, good relations between the Native Americans and the Pilgrims lasted only a few years. Disease and land disputes produced bitter conflicts, culminating in the first Indian War of 1675. As calamitous as this event was, it was merely the beginning of centuries of persecution of Native Americans at the hand of, of European Americans. Through much of the 18th century, violence between Native tribes and ever encroaching white settlers led to a succession of bloody conflicts. Many whites believed in the doctrine of manifest destiny, the notion that the racial superiority of the white race granted them rights to the land. But during the earlier years of American independence, the political climate seemed to be shifting in favor of Native American rights. In 1792, President George Washington met with 50 tribal chiefs in Philadelphia. In his subsequent message to Congress, he encouraged the furtherance of peaceable relations between whites and Native Americans and intimated that citizenship would be offered to the natives in the near future. 
During his, administ during his administration, Thomas Jefferson continued the policy, believing assimilation as the eventual goal. But by the administration of James Monroe, the sad and unfortunate practice of marginalizing Native Americans resurfaced. This time, however, the focus was on Native American removal, the forced migration of what were termed the five civilized tribes, the Seminole, Cherokee, Muscogee, Chickaw, Chick Chickasaw, and Choctaw from their ancestral lands in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi to areas west of the Mississippi River. In 1824, Secretary of War John Calhoun drew up the first plans to implement the idea. But despite the apparent cruelty of the move, American authorities didn't, did not recon, didn't recognize the, troops, the tribes as independent nations and intended to fully compensate for them for their losses. In 1829, however, Andrew Jackson became president and pursued forced migration much more vigorously culminating in the, in the Indian Removal Act of, six, of 1830. The, the law mandated the expulsion of all remaining members of the five tribes to lands in Canada, or excuse me, in Kansas or Oklahoma. The route, traveled, uh, the route traveled became known tragically as the Trail of Tears. Little concern was given to their welfare during the transit, resulting in disease, starvation, and the deaths of thousands. Several modern historians now label this event as an example of genocide. In addition to the original areas of the five nations, tribes in other states, including Michigan, were subject to the Indian Removal Act. For various reasons, however, a relatively low number of Native Americans in Michigan were actually evicted. A number of, Ottawa of the Ottawa tribe escaped to the, uh, from the northeastern Lower Peninsula to Canada while a number of Potawatomi moved from Wisconsin to the Upper Peninsula and for years were unnoticed, perhaps due to the extreme remoteness of the area. Many of their descendants were among the thousands of mine workers who toiled in the late 19th and much of the 20th centuries. It wasn't until 1934 that Congress passed the Wheeler-Howard Act. The law abolished the previous proce process of, elimination, of assimilation, encouraged the preservation of Native American culture, and set up a system of protected lands or reservations with which we are familiar with today. But this did not fully elevate Native Americans to the level of complete equality. One example is that this is the only recently abolished practice of naming professional and amateur sports teams with pejorative labels attributed to Native Americans, redskins, warriors, chiefs, and the like. Uh, often said, Often said teams would, off, would have a mascot dressed in Native American garb in an often cartoonish way, wearing feathers or wielding a tomahawk. Descendants of the Wampanoag commemorate the victims of their past with an annual observance of the National Day of Mourning, held on the fourth Thursday of November to coincide with Thanksgiving Day. The event originated in 1970 when Frank James, a descendant of the Wampanoag, was invited to deliver a speech uh, at a Thanksgiving Day event sponsored by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to celebrate the 350th anniversary of the landing of the Mayflower. But after an advanced review of his planned remarks, his draft was rejected, claiming the text was inconsistent with the occasion by stating, quote, the theme of the anniversary celebration is brotherhood and anything inflammatory would have been out of place, unquote. Instead, he was asked to deliver an alternative speech prepared by the event's public relations team. James refused and along with other senior Wampanoag leaders organized an alternative event to be held on the same day. The occasion attracted speakers and attendees from all the nation. On that day, he delivered an abbreviated version of his original speech, remarking, we forfeited our country. Our lands have fallen into the hands of the aggressor. We have allowed the white man to keep us on our knees. What has happened cannot be changed but today we must work towards a more humane America, a more Indian America, where men and nature are, again, are once again important, where the Indian values of honor, truth, and brotherhood prevail. You, the white man, are celebrating an anniversary. We, the Wampanoags, will help you celebrate in the concept, the concept of a beginning. It was the beginning of a new life for the pilgrims. Now, 350 years later, it is the beginning of a new dimension for the original American, the American Indian. The controversy over the appropriation of Native American themes involves the Detroit area. 
In 2020, Jared Ten Brink, a member of the Nottawasepi tribe of uh, Hurons, of uh, Huron brand, band of Potawatomi, and a resident of the east side, village of, uh, east side neighborhood of Indian Village, led an effort to change the name of the upscale community, arguing that Native Americans never resided in the area. Speculation suggests that the developers of the subdivision concocted the name in the, in the 1890s as a reference to a horse racing track that once occupied the site. Two of the present day street names, Iroquois and Seminole, are believed to be the names of two of the track's horses. Strong community opposition led to the proposal's defeat, although Indian Village Homeowners Association did change the name of their monthly newsletter, which was previously called Smoke Signals. So what is the path forward? Virtually all of us would agree that in order to chart our future, we must honestly confront our past, a process now underway, but by no means complete. Perhaps the best observation we can make is to recognize the similar that similarities do exist between the Native and the Euro-American concepts of celebration and gratitude. The centuries-old Wampanoag celebration of Cranberry Day, a harvest festival, dovetails with our present-day observance of Thanksgiving. Both emotions express the, gra of the, gratitude of e the emotion of gratitude, one of the most universal emotions of the human heart. Please rise and body your spirit in singing hymn number 346. We will sing all four verses. Go now, go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service 
begins. Amen. Blessed be.